first, we have um, Dr. Kenneth Alper here today to start us off with kind of an overview of Ibogaine as it's been known in Western awareness. Um, Dr. Alper is a bit of an Ibogaine OG. Um, I've had the honor to know him for several years now, and I'm going to read his bio and then turn things over to him. So Kenneth Alper, MD, is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology at New York University School of Medicine. He is author of over 70 peer-reviewed publications, books, and book chapters, and his research has been supported by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. His research on Iboga alkaloids has spanned the disciplines of neuropharmacology, toxicology, and medical ethnography. He edited the only English language scientific text on Ibogaine with Stanley Glick, the leading preclinical researcher on Iboga alkaloids. Dr. Alper collaborated extensively with Howard Lotsoff, the discoverer of Ibogaine's effect on drug dependence in humans. His clinical research has also included the relationship of trauma and abuse to dissociative symptomatology. His published collaborations with the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner and the NYU Department of Cardiology have valuably informed efforts to identify potential hazards associated with Ibogaine use. I'm delighted to introduce to Naropa's cohort of trainees this year to Dr. Ken Alpert. So um, I don't think I have to tell much of this audience that um, uh, Ibogaine uh, is derived from the Tanabrin anti-Iboga plant in terms of where it occurs naturally. Uh, it is also made by a semi-synthetic process uh, from Loacangine, which is probably a more sustainable and you know, pure way of, um, of uh, isolating the, uh, the main product. Um, it's an alkaloid. Uh, it's a chemical class that subsumes uh, naturally occurring medically useful compounds. Um, I think an important thing to think about is alkaloids is that humans do not manufacture amino acids. Uh, amino acids such as tryptophan form this, the basis for the skeleton for our neurotransmitters, such as serotonin in the case of tryptophan. Uh, and uh, the indoles uh, are also derived uh, from, uh, uh, the, um, uh, from tryptophan. Uh, so basically, there is this kind of symmetry between plant life and animal life in terms of um, uh, the alkaloids being uh, derived from the same uh, you know, building blocks and chemical backbones as our neurotransmitters, which is why there are many psychoactive uh, alkaloids. Um, uh, the alkaloids also occur, you know, uh, also include many drugs uh, that are abusable, uh, such as morphine uh, and cocaine. Uh, Ibogaine has been used in medical and non-medical settings to treat substance use disorders. Um, this story goes back further than a lot of people realize. Um, Siva, a uh, pharmaceutical company, which is now part of Novartis, uh, many you know, M&E and mergers and acquisitions later, uh, patented Ibogaine as an approach to reducing opioid analgesic tolerance in 1957. And this is really interesting. You know, think about whether uh, you know, if somebody had a, uh, a, a therapy that would alleviate, you know, tolerance to opioid analgesics, and it were a brand new molecule and patentable, um, you know, if it were IP that the, um, uh, the industry could profit from, we would probably be hearing something about it. Uh, but the patent on Ibogaine that I'm showing you here uh, uh, Quietly expired um, at the um, in uh, the you know long ago, probably sometime in the 60s. Uh, very interesting. Uh, the exact mechanism or cause of the potentiating activity is unknown, and it remains unknown. Ibogaine's mechanism of action remains unknown, which is probably what's so interesting about it. Next slide. Um, Ibogaine, uh, the effect of Ibogaine on uh, drug dependence, on, uh, on opiate, uh, on physical dependence on opioids was discovered by Howard Lotsoff, a serendipitous observation. Uh, Howard was basically part of a network of lay drug experimenters. This is before the hallucinogens, or what they were called at the time, were scheduled and people could see it's like the Ken Kesey era uh, and people could obtain and try these things. And basically what they did is they took notes on their on their experiences. Um, I've called Howard an engaging provocateur of scientific curiosity, credentialed only with an undergraduate degree in filmmaking. 
Uh, Howard would go on to nearly single-handedly persuade the National Institute of Drug Abuse to undertake its program of research on Ibogaine uh, from 1991 to 1996. That was about two million in direct costs, which would be about six million in direct costs right now, which would be a big grant. Um, uh, this is a setting uh, in which early Ibogaine treatments were carried out in the Netherlands. Uh, and in, in, you know, as far as my, oh, uh, that's the next slide. Uh, it should be people standing in front of an apartment. There you go. Um, and uh, so this is a typical setting of Ibogaine treatments in the Netherlands in the late 1980s. And for me, this is ground zero, um, not really Gabon and Bwihi. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, the Junkie Bund and the Netherlands are really sort of the aboriginal ground zero as far as my study of uh, Ibogaine is concerned. Um, uh, so I, uh, next slide. This is a paper I co-authored with Howard. By the way, Howard is a co-author on, on the pop and these, uh, on the publications in Ibogaine that I've done that are most cited. Um, Howard is the co-author. Uh, and uh, so at any rate, we systematically described the settings of Ibogaine use. Uh, in, and this was published in 2008, imagine that. It's almost 15 years old at this point. Uh, and this work really needs to be updated. The um, Ibogaine, the settings of Ibogaine use um, have, I think, multiplied both in terms of numbers of people treated, obviously, which I would guess is probably around fourfold by now. Uh, and uh, also just the, the variety of settings, particularly uh, when Howard and I did this paper, um, the settings of Ibogaine use were um, more concentrated in fewer uh, uh, providers, and we were able to access them you know, systematically. Uh, the scene is obviously much more fragmented now, uh, where people are uh, obtaining Ibogaine uh, which used to be much more difficult to find. Uh, so there's a, I think it would be much more challenging now to actually do what we did at that time, which is basically estimate the extent of Ibogaine use in the world. Um, okay, so what is a psychedelic? Um, Ibogaine is regarded as psychedelic. Uh, it would be regarded as a, a non-classical psychedelic. They mediate experiences that may be difficult to describe. But the term psychedelic for practical purposes denotes it's a specific set of compounds that includes Ibogaine. Uh, and there is presently interest, obviously, in developing psychedelics as, as, psychedel as psychiatric treatments. Um, and uh, there are basically two categories of psychedelics. There are the classical psychedelics, which are uh, agonists at the serotonin type 2A receptor. And that would include uh, LSD and psilocybin, uh, mescaline. Uh, and then there are also the non-classicals, and Ibogaine would be, on, would be long in the non-classical category. Um, the most currently influential hypothesis regarding the mechanism of action of psychedelics relates to neuroplasticity or psychoplasticity. Uh, the you know, um, metaphor of rewiring uh, is often used. Uh, and basically, um, I think that what is essential to think about in terms of psychedelics is linkages between representations, where representations are thoughts or memories or perceptions, and motivational states. Motivational states are basically preparatory sets for either approach or avoidance. Uh, and there are rigid linkages between these uh, thoughts and motivational, these um, representations and motivational sets. And I believe that the, uh, a good way to um, conceptualize what psychedelics do is they operate on these rigid linkages and make them more fluid. Um, learning uh, is the modification of future thought or behavior based on prior experience and learning involved neuroplasticity. Uh, so neuroplasticity is at the heart of the learning process, which I think in turn is the heart of what is uh, therapeutic about psychedelics. Um, uh, individuals who take Ibogaine often report um, a, an exceptional kind of experience that I think is more um, specific to Ibogaine and not to uh, the classical psychedelics, which is the slideshow, um, a recall of a, a dense succession of uh, vivid autobiographical memories that have been turned the slideshow. Uh, also uh, with Ibogaine, another distinction from classical hallucinogens is the representations that have previously been associated with links to addiction 
um, are reevaluated. Uh, and you know, basically, people describe looking at the events that have been you know, brought uh, up into, you know, in, into a consciousness during uh, the Ibogaine experience and evaluating this uh, you know, when they're less linked to problematic emotions that may have previously interfered with their processing. So I, I think equanimity, equanimity is really at the heart of the therapeutic aspect of the Ibogaine experience, particularly uh, you know, following uh, the um, the most you know vivid uh, you know um, uh, visionary experience. Uh, next slide. Uh, this I think is a really um, informative characterization. You know, in, in ethnography, medical ethnography, which I think is really the basis of my that's my methodologic origin in this whole thing. Uh, it's, you know, what the patient says in their own words is really kind of the gold standard. And this is my favorite quote of the entire, you know, oral literature of, uh, on Ibogaine. It's as if all the information in your brain file cabinet is shaken out of its drawers into one big pile, looked at objectively and put back in untwisted from emotional trauma. Uh, this was, uh, I, I think, a choice quote that Howard uh, included in his chapter in the um, IBM uh, conference volume. Next slide. Um, so this is, uh, there was a brief reference to the MAP study, uh, and this is follow-up uh, in the MAP study in terms of uh, the outcomes. Uh, and so basically, it's called a spaghetti plot. Uh, each individual line is the trajectory of one individual, um, and you have the, uh, the y-axis, the vertical axis is the uh, drug use score of the addiction severity index, uh, and um, the drug use score is improved when it is lower, and what you see is a great decrease in the first um, month, for sure, first three months that is variably sustained across time. Uh, anyway, this is, you know, definitely, uh, you know, visually impressive uh, in terms of, uh, 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 portraying an effect, depicting an effect. Um, and so, you know, this is the, uh, this is uh, from the paper on the MAP study that we published in 2017. Okay. Uh, medical risks. This is really important. Um, there have been deaths associated with Ibogaine, and the most uh, important domain of medical risk is probably uh, cardiac. Um, and uh, one uh, important thing to keep in mind is that risk factors, um, which are to, met, to a great extent controllable, uh, include pre-existing cardiac disease, which you prevent with uh, appropriate screening, Problems with electrolyte status, which you um, uh, prevent with appropriate hydration and nutritional support of the patient before the treatment. Uh, and also, uh, and I get some pushback from this from the providers, the use of ethnopharmacological forms such as crude alkaloid extracts of unknown composition are associated with greater cardiac risk. They also may be associated with, uh, with you know, significant clinical benefits that you may not get from the pure uh, you know, from the pure alkaloid, that's an ongoing discussion. Uh, but basically, what we're probably dealing with is an ensemble effect, which is basically with naturally occurring alkaloids, there's usually a main alkaloid, such as ibogaine, and then there are other auxiliary alkaloids that are very structurally similar that potentiate the effect of the main one. You're probably potentiating therapeutic effects and side effects, both with the ensemble effect that you would see in an alkaloid extract as opposed to um, pure uh, ibogaine hydrochloride. Um, and so we talked about the mitigation of these risks. Uh, it's very important, and this is something I think the field has become a lot more aware of um, than in the, uh, in the earlier days. Um, the uh, next slide. Also another you know, ongoing conversation with the Ibogaine community is that um, Ibogaine can be thought of as a, um, a step in the ethnopharmacological paradigm, the observation in a native setting of use of some kind of compound, some kind of treatment, and then the isolated, um, the uh, active ingredient is isolated 
uh, and then systematically modified to try and optimize response as well as diminish side effects. Uh, the most prominent example of this so far uh, has been 18 methoxy coronarity. The G word, uh, you know, lest we forget, uh, you know, our, our patients, there's a big dichotomy uh, between what we as physicians in clinical medicine, uh, conventional clinical medicine, are comfortable with regarding references to God, which we never talk about, uh, but our patients talk about it all the time. Patients typically uh, view uh, their recovery in spiritual terms. The term God is infrequent in clinical discourse, but patterns use it, uh, patients use it all the time. Uh, so the resolution of linkages between representations and pathological motivational states is not just a desired clinical outcome of psychedelic or other treatments, but it's also a smart cardinal spiritual goal. And this is where I think there may be an intersection between the use of these drugs as sacraments and the use of these drugs therapeutically. That may not totally be an accident. Uh, it may not be entirely unexpected that naturally occurring alkaloids used in sacramental indigenous context may provide leads for the development of pharmacotherapy for trauma-related disorders and addiction. Uh, that may not be um, a coincidence. Uh, and I think that's the last slide, yeah. So moving ahead now to Elizabeth Bast, a uh, traditional facilitator. Um, I will read her bio and hand it over to her. Elizabeth Bast serves as a writer, certified yoga teacher, performance artist, Bwiti initiate, and traditionally trained ceremonial facilitator, speaker educator, and holistic coach specializing in sacred plant medicine support, spirit-led addiction recovery, and visionary life design. She is a lifelong devotee of plant medicine, ceremony, and prayer, having been raised within a long family line of plant healers and an intertribal community with traditional ceremony. Bast is a recipient of a Woman of the Psychedelic Renaissance grant from the psychedelic feminist organization Cosmic Sister and a member of Cosmic Sister's expert advisory circle. She's the author of Heart Medicine, A True Love Story, an intimate memoir about a healing experience with the African sacred medicine, Iboga. Since 2007, she has lived and co-created with artist Chor Boogie. Together, they have produced numerous collaborations of visual and performance art at galleries, museums, and special events. After their healing experience with Iboga, Bast, and Chor were inspired to give back. In December 2014, the couple traveled to Gabon, Africa, where they began their Iboga provider training and experienced a traditional Bwiti initiation, rite of passage, and wedding. They are educators and activists for Iboga, sacred medicine sustainability, the Bwiti tradition, drug policy reform, and holistic addiction treatment. They serve as Iboga providers with the Soul Centro team in Costa Rica. Elizabeth, it's an honor to have you. Take it away. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, so much uh, for this opportunity. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up. Yay, okay. Oh, thank you, Kevin. I want to say thank you to the spirit of Iboga, who I know as a spirit, who I know as a being and a master teacher, a generous, wild, opulent maestro. I want to say thank you to the Bwiti who have studied this medicine over eons upon eons and are so intimate. They have so much to share and to teach us, especially in uh, the younger, uh, the, the, the younger and very important discipline of psychotherapy in the West. Uh, they have so much to share and they are so generous. I want to say thank you to my teachers, Grandmaster Binana and Mama Nunu Mokori. Thank you, Naropa. Thank you for your kind attention, all the students. Thank you, Gray, our translator. And thank you to Dr. Kenneth Alper, who has been an inspiration to us from the very beginning, being able to find this medicine. So I'll begin with a very short personal story. A decade ago, the love of my life experienced a very serious life-threatening opioid and polysubstance relapse, like many in the world at this time. And on the eve of, over, you know, and over some time, we sought out and studied, researched the iboga medicine and made a decision to go that was very much soul-guided. 
uh, and guided by Kenneth Alper's research. <laughs> and on the eve of his first ceremony, his first iboga ceremony, I could barely recognize the man that I had fallen in love with. He was so possessed with a foreign entity and an insatiable presence that was taking up more and more space within him. I now recognize this as one of the many spirits, spirits of addiction, which I understand in the Buiti framework as a presence that was really taking his very strong body and strong mind for a joy ride. And it wanted to ride him so fast and so hard. It wanted to ride him right into the grave. And I could hear, uh, I could hear his ancestors whispering to me the whole time, guiding, guiding, you know, be careful, the critical points. Uh, and it was a very deep process to understand how to navigate, how to support him without losing myself, which is another conversation. So we went in to that first Iboga ceremony when I could barely recognize him. The next day, 12 hours later, I could see his soul again shining through the man I could recognize, the man I loved. And he said four words that are forever etched into my soul. He said, I love my life. I never, he said, I never want to disrespect myself again. Isn't that the root of all healing? Iboga and Ibogaine have a ferocious reputation. And for good reason. I can safely say that this medicine, especially in the form of Iboga, in ceremonial doses, which we understand and hear many times over is stronger than ibogaine, is the strongest and fastest detox on planet Earth, not only for the body, but also for mind and soul. And few people know, I mean, that's what they know. Few people know that iboga is the ultimate plant medicine of peace and bliss and wellness truth, knowledge, and visionary creative fulfillment. And it's because most people stop working with the medicine after that initial heavy shakedown detox. Few people know what is waiting for them down the path. Few people know that detox is just what Iboga does with its pinky finger so that it can take people to its deeper divine purposes which is soul connection, soul healing, trauma healing, holistic wellness, our deepest soul aligned fulfillment, clarity of direction and visionary creativity. This has to do with our highest service to humanity. And all of you know how important it is to feel that you are giving your highest service to humanity and planet in celebration of the divine. So I want to share with you that Iboga works in phases and layers. It's not a one trick pony. It's an epic PhD program. <laughs> and how can we, so the, the topic here is supporting people through healing addiction with this medicine. So that is what I will focus on here, even though it does so much more. Uh, so how can we best support healing addiction with this medicine? Now, please bear in mind that this is a humble introduction to this master medicine. In the perspective of our Buiti team, this medicine really requires a decade of study simply to become a beginner. So we come to you as beginners, offering what we know after a decade of deep study. And there's so much more, you know, uh, Binana and Mokori have been studying this medicine for many decades. And they have so much more to teach. So it's important to know um, that healing addiction with Iboga or Ibogaine is one piece to the puzzle. It's not all of it, and it's not a magic pill, which I know many of you know. Um, so what are the other pieces to this puzzle? Tending our holistic wellness, looking at things like functional medicine. Maybe some people have, for example, mycotoxicity, candida, uh, heavy metal poisoning, chronic inflammation, food allergies, hormonal imbalance, and these things can be affecting 
and contributing to their addiction. They might be self-medicating as a part of those things. Uh, and the trauma that they have had can affect all these other physical issues. So holistic wellness, integration work is very important. Having the life skills to deal with life is very important, including the ability to feel feelings. It's an art uh, and the art of thinking. We wanna look past mental health into mental art and supporting uplifting cohesive community, essential ingredient and the Buiti know a lot about social medicine. Soul aligned creative expression and service, like we talked about, and a safe space to live and be. It's a nothing short of a potential death sentence to send someone into this medicine uh, and then send them back into an extremely unsafe environment. So we need to really look at the environment. Do they have the resources, the support to live a new life? Otherwise, they'll go right back and the relapse will be more dangerous, which I will talk about because tolerance has dropped to zero after this medicine. So I'm inspired to share some things that Iboga and the Buiti have taught me about healing addiction. There's only two reasons why people take a medicine or drug that affects their consciousness, that alters their consciousness. So one is to face life and to run from life is the other reason to face life or run from life. If we want to put it in different words, we can say to face truth or run from truth, to face love or run from love, to enter the present moment or to flee from it. So when people come uh, and approach Iboga or Ibogaine, you as therapists, uh, as, as supporters, as wisdom carriers of this medicine can support people to have the right intention Otherwise, this medicine can be extremely dangerous or at least extremely hard on people. So people must have the right intention. People must be ready or at least willing to face and embrace the truth. People must want to truly live and to live fully and, and uh, to create a life that they don't want to run away from. And this is what we call as medicine people sobriety not never taking a substance that affects our consciousness, but to face life, face truth, face love, and face and embrace the present moment. This is sobriety, and to come to medicines with respect and intentionality. So addiction is fundamentally a reach for medicine, because addiction is Beyond solely a psychological or physical problem, at the root, we understand it as a soul wound. Um, and many of you maybe have studied Gabor Mate or Johan Hari to understand that it's a reach for medicine to soothe this soul wound. And we must remember that in order to truly offer compassionate care, it is not a moral failing, right? Uh, and Eboga says, there is no healing without love. We must love even the parts of ourselves that become addicted for it is essentially an act of self-preservation and an act of self-love, albeit a dangerous one. We understand addiction as actually not just a problem to overcome, but as a sacred messenger, bringing a message that we have a serious need, a need that has gone unheard, so it now is screaming. So often people are so busy trying to crush the addiction, trying to overcome the addiction that they never ask why it came. And thus, they miss its message. Addiction will become louder and louder and more deadly and more deadly until the message is heard. It arrives, so how does it get addiction arrives through the portal of trauma? And what we understand in the Buiti as uh, what happens with trauma. In the West, we call it disassociation. In the Buiti, we understand it as the soul ejecting itself from a moment in which it doesn't have the resources, the skills to be present. It's an intelligence, like, let's get out of here. <laughs> you all know about how powerful disassociation is and how common it is in trauma. And, and unfortunately, uh, even though it helps us to survive the moment, when we vacate our vessel, this is like our house that we inhabit, when we vacate our vessel to any degree, 
just like an abandoned house, it becomes vacancy for spiritual parasites that we might call the spirit of depression, the spirit of anxiety, spirits of addiction, spirit of OCD, and so on. These different um, issues are not a label that we put on people or a diagnosis that we give them in the Bwiti, but we see that it's a spirit that visits and it can go. So iboga, and nothing, nothing wrong with any other system, this is just a different perspective. And it's very important to talk about symptoms. It's very important to talk about how we suffer. So iboga held in the Misoko Bwiti, in particular, because there's different lineages of the Bwiti, uh, there are specific modalities that help, help us to help people to reconnect to their souls. Sometimes souls, because of the disassociation, can become so distant, they're barely tethered. And it looks like people can be wearing a mask of their own face. They're not all the way in the present moment. So this reconnection with the soul and healing that relationship is vital because the soul is our golden compass that has all the answers to everything we need for happiness and everything we need for safety. So that relationship is very important. Uh, we understand addiction as actually an initiation. It's a very important initiation. And we tell people that this is your initiation. This is your soul screaming for itself. You've hit a brick wall. And addiction can present an opportunity for breakthrough. So that reframe can be very helpful for some people. And in my understanding, I cannot judge anyone else's initiation or the timeline of their initiation. All I can do is draw boundaries for myself that are, that are safe. <laughs> That's all I can do. Um, and wait for people to be ready, to be hungry. And we understand from Iboga that addiction is actually the human condition. Everyone has addictions to some degree or another, in some form or another, to some degree or another. And we include addictions as problematic thought patterns. Uh, blame can be an addiction. Rage can be an addiction. There's many addictions, behavioral addictions as well. So Iboga taught me, you know, we have this problem of impulse and we talk about healing impulse loops, right? Healing impulse loops. What Iboga taught me is that there is no healing impulse loops. We can retrain a little bit. What we can do is make a new impulse make a new impulse and work on that impulse. And that's how we heal our impulse issues. Make a new impulse. It could be a personal mantra from the medicine. It could be a personal practice delivered from the medicine or from our soul. It could be saying the truth and not talking about positive thinking, truthful thinking. What is true? I am capable of many things in this moment is true, right? So making a new impulse. And Community is essential. We can't do it alone. The Bwiti knows so much about this social medicine. It has been the most beautiful transmission for me to visit them and be in their ceremonies all night that are like, if you imagine the most lit uh, Baptist choir, and then imagine them going 200% all night in the jungle with fire, dancing and singing all night at full velocity, my husband calls it being a, on a freight train on a freight train on a rocket ship on a roller coaster, and everyone is cohesive and everyone is singing. It's really impossible to come out of that lonely or sad. So, uh, bringing that energy into our communities of dancing, singing, drumming, cohesion, community ritual is imperative for the past. The another thing that Iboga has taught me about uh, addiction is that sometimes people, and often, actually all the time, when people have intense addictions, they actually have really serious superpowers that are not being channeled. These are sometimes the most feeling people, the most sensitive or most creative people, and uh, they're not fully harnessing or using their superpowers. And I like to tell them, you have superpowers because they have so stigmatized themselves. They have so internalized a stigma, but every superpower has a liability, many liabilities. 
So we study our superpowers, but also the liabilities, and we must express and share our superpowers every day. Uh, in addition, I see this a lot in the world of ibogaine, clinical ibogaine, and I would like to see this change, is that when we take medicine with a consumer customer mindset, where we are taking a substance for our own gain without treating the medicine like a spirit, this can be very problematic. When we treat the medicine like a mere commodity, then we become a commodity in our own lives and in our own society. Human beings are commodities in late stage capitalism. So coming to the medicine with respect and devotion, like a relationship, reciprocity. For example, if we're friends with someone, like, you know, uh, I'm friends with Kevin. If I'm always asking Kevin for $5 and I never give him anything back, he's going to get sick of me. And he's not going to give me the full gold in his relationship with me. It's the same thing, offering as much of ourselves as we are asking, relating to the medicine as a spirit and a guest of honor that we listen to because the medicine can only give us what we give to the medicine. Uh, and the art of feeling feelings is vital. The art of feeling feelings, there's many, 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 many modalities that can help with this, that we can be a part of teaching people with breath, with art, with expression, with community, with movement, uh, with healing modalities. So without the art of feeling feelings, it's going to be dangerous. So why detox is not enough? People don't stay sober by getting sober. A lot of people come into Ibogaine or even Iboga and say, I just wanna get sober. I just wanna get sober. People will not stay sober by just getting sober. People stay sober when they are expressing their soul aligned visionary creative expression, when they have a sense of purpose, when they're giving their highest, uh, when they have deeply attuned relationships, when they have inner fulfillment, they have the ability to face the truth, when they have authentic happiness and unconditional peace or a practice of unconditional peace. And in that way, we can't just aim for ground zero with people in recovery, but rather the eagle's flight. And this is why sometimes multiple treatments over the course of seasons can be very helpful even going to Africa for some people to go well beyond ground zero into our most visionary life. So we are seeing, I wanna share, we are seeing safer, more effective, more fruitful and longer lasting results with what we call pre-tox, which is a customized preliminary detox coaching that we do for people because we at Soul Centro do not work with acute detox. And there's the reason we see all of that, higher, uh, higher frequency outcomes. When people come cleaner to the medicine, the cleaner you come to the medicine, the more the medicine gives you. And just because somebody is clean does, does not mean that they are healed. Um, do we have someone unmuted? Let's mute that. Uh, so like the Bwiti say, you have to be clean to enter the spirit world. And the spirit world are where all of those goods are at for sustaining sobriety, insight, inspiration, understanding, letting go, acceptance, releasing of attachments, uh, courage, authentic self-love, deep forgiveness, ability to be in the present moment, coping skills, connectedness to nature and all of life so that illusion of separation falls away, relationship guidance and clarity of direction. And often, those goods, those gems come after the first ceremony. And that's why we always do two treatments in our eight day retreats. And sometimes three if someone's coming with really deep, heavy addiction. So we prefer to work with people who are clear enough to appreciate a traditional ceremony and for all those other reasons. So it's important to know that treatment with iboga or ibogaine can actually put people at a high risk for relapse, overdose, and death. Why is that? Uh, unless it's properly held. So when you take, the addiction is there for a reason. 
So when you take the Band-Aid and you rip it away and someone doesn't have all of the coping skills to deal with life uh, and they don't have a safe environment and they don't have a supportive community and they don't know how to feel their feelings, they're at a very high risk of overdose and because if they relapse, they can die because their tolerance has dropped to zero. There are very few Ibogaine centers that I believe are doing a very good job at coaching people with plenty of preparation and integration. And it's very important to have extra support, whether it's a therapist, coach, um, or a psychedelic peer support um, that's skilled. So we need to remember that. Yes, there's a lot of them will that will take people's money. But it can be more unsafe, you know, especially people going into places like um, uh, Tijuana, where there's drugs everywhere. <laughs> it's not a good idea. I've, I can't remember how many times I've heard, I went to Tijuana for Ibogaine, walked out and, and overdosed, or walked down and got drugs. So when people are set on Ibogaine, we encourage people to ensure they have that extensive preparation and integration support a safe space waiting for them, holistic healthcare resources, supportive community, or consider there's a treatment called Ibogaine Step Down, which walks people through more integrated uh, and safe process because it'll walk people down, chipping away at their dose over two weeks, much more integrated than a single blast flood dose of Ibogaine or Iboga. So it can be really helpful for some individuals to go slower. And also the provider can watch them and coach them through all the things that are coming up during that process instead of a single blast. So last, I believe I have just a couple more minutes. Is that all right, Kevin? Yeah, just one more minutes. minute, Elizabeth, yeah. Got it. I will end by sharing some of the traditional purposes of this medicine, which are so far beyond detox. Spiritual awakening, initiation, Answering the questions of our soul. People come to the medicine with their deepest, most meaningful questions. Spiritual and physical healing. Shamanic diagnosis and prescription. This is something that they started to teach us. It's fascinating, fascinating. Uh, Self-study and mindfulness, study of life. And of course, soul healing and soul connection. This is a hunter's medicine that helps us hunt our destiny. They take it in microdoses out in the jungle to, to have physical endurance, mental endurance, and spiritual endurance, that focus also to hunt our destiny. It's a very yang medicine in that way uh, at times. It's very much a spiritual warrior medicine, helping us with confrontation and courage, helps us with purpose, service, visionary creativity, uh, solutions for problems and challenges. I'd love to see climate change scientists and policymakers and change makers get this medicine protection and seeing beyond the eyes, divination and prophecy, uh, community celebration, communication with nature and nature spirits directly, fertility, virility and aphrodisiac purposes long-term, finding a mate, navigating and tending human relationships, communion with ancestors, healing ancestral lines, deep self-love, remote viewing, astral travel and spiritual discovery that never ends. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was fantastic. Um, I'm so grateful to have you here uh, along with your lineage of training on the call as well. I think the work that Elizabeth and Shore and her team do is a great example of the indigenous reciprocity kind of theme that we've discussed a lot throughout this training. So I'm really honored for your attention on um, on this topic. So before we shift into q and I have prepared um, a presentation from myself. So thank you, Sarah, for reading my bio earlier. Essentially, my presentation is a bit of a long form bio and background um, to myself and a variety of different things that I've been involved with and why over time they've had very interesting focuses on Iboga and Ibogaine. Um, I do just want to give a brief um, content warning. I'm going to be somewhat vague about that, but there is uh, imagery around um, loss, nothing graphic, um, but I do want to share that with you, and I will not feel offended if anyone um, needs to look away or, or even mute at a certain point, but I just want to give that heads up. So 
So I grew up in a loving family in suburban Long Island. Somehow, despite the cookie cutter upbringing, or perhaps because of it, perhaps because of it, I managed to become utterly fascinated with psychedelics. By the end of high school, uh, despite displaying signs of depression, post-traumatic stress, cannabis dependence, and anticipatory grief, I began my undergraduate program in Boston and was determined to become involved in whatever was happening around psychedelics. The middle photo is from my first attendance at the Horizons Conference in 2008, and the side photos are from the projects I was involved in at the Harvard Medical School Psychiatric Research Lab, where I volunteered as a research assistant. In fall 2008, I founded a chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy at Northeastern University after no academic department or existing student group agreed to sponsor an Ibogaine conference I had been asked to host in Boston by the head of an organization called Cures Not Wars, a man named Dana Beal. Northeastern SSDP brought an international roster of advocates, researchers, and treatment providers for a three-day conference on Ibogaine over President's Day weekend. Ironically, within weeks of the conference, my depression, unresolved trauma, acute distress from the losses of my elders, and increasingly problematic relationships with various substances, I began to develop an opiate use disorder that culminated shortly after my attendance at the Psychedelic Science Conference. Shown here with Carolyn Mountain Girl Garcia, who, by the way, had her first drug experience with Ibogaine, and Stan and Christina Groff. Stan's keynote address was one of the main reasons I wanted to attend the conference, and it was during this talk that I learned of my grandfather's passing. As a result of the year-long progression in what became a severe addiction to oxycodone, I returned to Long Island for the summer after walking in the ceremony with my graduating class, but needing at least one more semester to earn my remaining credits. Instead, after a failed attempt at self-tapering to achieve abstinence from opiates, which was out of a personal commitment to my late grandfather's memory, I wound up transitioning to injection heroin use. The consequences I had been able to avoid up until then, thanks in no short part to the privileges and resources I was brought up in and around, finally caught up to me, and a felony arrest while in a drug-induced psychosis led to a coerced admission to a residential program. But after re relapsing within weeks of completion, 10 months later, a loving, compassionate, and unconditional intervention from my mother expressed simply by the question, are you okay? I decided to ask for help and offered in exchange for a leap of faith request in her and my dad to pay for Ibogaine treatment in Mexico. In return, I agreed to move to a halfway house in South Florida, follow the 12-step recovery program I'd been introduced to, and become self-supporting. I began provided an interruption to my addiction in the form of the most compassionate opiate detox treatment I can think of, being relieved of my withdrawal symptoms while simultaneously experiencing a transformational mystical journey enabled me to surrender and become open to a new way of life. I found that new way of life thanks to self-love, community, service, and patience. After seven months in Florida, I decided to return to Boston and finish my degree. I became active in Northeastern's Science Magazine, and soon I was both writing and presenting my own work, as well as being interviewed for articles about Ibogaine, thanks to the publication of the MAP study I had enrolled in. Earning my bachelor's in 2013, I eventually moved to New York City and enrolled in a graduate psychology program at the New School. Coming full circle, I co-authored a peer-reviewed paper and presented work on the history of psychedelics and the treatment of psychotic disorders at Psychedelic Science 2017. But later that year, in a cruel twist of fate, my father passed away suddenly while on a scuba diving vacation with my mom. He didn't know it at the time, but due to the stress of grad school, I had begun to self-medicate with Kratom and by the time of his passing, I was already flirting with temptation to inject heroin again. Writing his obituary and giving his eulogy with my brother and sister were small comforts in the wake of tremendous suffering. With the slippery slope I had been sliding down already, the pain of his loss and the sadness of my last interactions with him being comments on the pictured Instagram posts, I relapsed between September 2017 and April 2018. Fortunately, the recovery fellowship I helped found in 2015 continued to trudge along, 
thanks to like-minded people in 12-step recovery who I met at Psychedelic Science 2017. We built enough of a foundation to meet the demand for online recovery at the beginning of the pandemic. PIR now boasts over 22 online meetings every week, and in-person groups are popping up around the country, including in Denver, LA, Austin, Berkeley, Las Vegas, and coming soon in Miami, New York City, and many more around the globe. Recovery from relapse carried baggage that kept me from embracing all of the tenants I had been able to the first time. But I found hope, and their names are Leah and Adrian. Pandemic be damned, we packed up our modest belongings and headed for Colorado. Leah, a middle school science teacher, me finishing my hours toward a licensed addiction counselor credential and finally earning my master's from the new school, and Adrian, an amazing young man with more wisdom and life experience than most teenagers. Building a family in late pandemic after moving across the country was no small feat, and we were excited to welcome our son, Nero, as we ended 2022. Picture it as Leah and I ringing in the new year at the hospital. We discharged the next day, excited to return in a couple of weeks for the C-section we had scheduled. But before we could get there, our beautiful baby boy wound up with nuchal cord asphyxia on January 5th. The shock and agony of the suffering we experienced was beyond words and continues to weigh heavy on our hearts. Given the struggles with grief I'd experienced many times over by this point in my life, I knew that if I didn't do something, I would likely relapse. So last month, I attended a retreat in Costa Rica involving two Bwiti style ceremonies in the Masoko tradition with the Holy Root of Iboga. My intention was to safely re-engage with emotions too intense for me to handle in order to move through my anger and allow for greater expression of the love I've been repressing, as well as to leave my addiction identity behind. These experiences helped me rediscover the love and compassion for myself I had been struggling to embrace since recovering from my relapse and re-engage with community in my full wholeness. Leah also would have joined me, but she'd gotten pregnant in August, and just before I departed for retreat, we learned that we were having a girl. With 2022 coming to a close, my spirit whole and my heart full, we are celebrating our time with Nero on New Year's Day to honor his first birthday. And with, excuse me. And with humble optimism, and present-minded excitement, we will always keep him in our awareness. As we focus on caring for ourselves, and each other to welcome our daughter, Dea Nira, on or around May 5th, 2023. Thank you all for your attention. Um, and that is my presentation. Yo! Ya badi moko ya mogo emba o Badi kakaona o Badi moko ya mango ete o Badi kakaona o Badi L'iboga, c'est euh, une plante qui n'existe que ici au Gabon. Si peut-être ils ont exploité l'iboga pour euh, aller et aller planter ailleurs, mais c'est le premier pays, c'est le Gabon. Et parmi dans le Gabon, il y a une province 
où Libora a beaucoup poussé, il y a dans l'Angounier, il y a dans le moyen Ogoué, il y a dans euh, la Nianga, et ensuite, a, dans l'estuaire, les gens ont peut-être, et pas peut-être, ils ont, ils ont planté. Mais ce que je sais de Libora, si Libora existe aujourd'hui, c'est depuis nos ancêtres. Et euh, Libora n'est pas fait seulement pour la désintoxication. Libora soigne beaucoup de maladies. Et euh, si seulement c'était fait pour, pour l'intoxication, non, ce n'est pas ça. Mais normalement, il y a des initiations. On trouve euh, les femmes qui initient au, au Mabanzi qu'avec Libora, ils initient le, le Odisumba qu'avec Libora, ils initient. Ils initient au Misoko, que Liboga, et les Mabundi aussi. Mm -hmm. C'est la même Ondea, toutes les, de, tout, les, les, les Ondea que Liboga. De toutes les façons, si Liboga était fait seulement pour la désintoxication, non, ça ne devrait pas exister. Mais je veux dire ceci que Liboga, c'est une plante sacrée. Ça s'appelle chez nous ici le bois sacré. Voilà. Le bois sacré. Donc, c'est un bois que vraiment qui n'est pas euh, partout, partout. Maintenant, avec Libora, on fait beaucoup de choses. Maintenant, euh, aujourd'hui, avant, euh, ce n'était pas aussi populaire que ça. On n'initiait pas euh, n'importe qui. Il y avait des langues ciblées pour Libora, les Michogo, les Masango, les Pouvi. Ensuite, les femmes, les Mabundi ont pris les, les, les femmes de, de Mabansi, ainsi de suite. Et voici que Libora a pris. C'était d'abord, c'était d'abord dans, c'était fait dans, dans des familles. Ce n'était pas propagé comme ça que les gens donnaient Libora à n'importe qui. Non, on allait s'initier à, à, à Libora avec condition de cause, avec une cause. Soit tu es malade, et soit tu partais toi-même t'initier ou on te pré on présentait euh, un de tes parents pour aller, pour aller s'initier à ta place pour voir quelle est la maladie qui t'embête et qui t'a donné le, la, la maladie. C'est un peu ça, Libora. Voilà euh, pourquoi euh, Libora. Maintenant, euh, le, aujourd'hui, on arrive maintenant à initier vous, toi-même, vous-même, vous voyez qu'on arrive à initier les, 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 les Occidentaux. Donc, comme, si, comme les Occidentaux aussi, nous a, nous, ils nous apprennent à parler leur langue. Donc, on est obligé de faire ça. Mais sinon, c'était interdit à des moments, les années 1800 et quelques, c'était très interdit pour initier les, les, les Occidentaux. Mais on a vu qu'avec l'évolution, le, le monde évolue, on est obligé de donner aussi notre culture aux occidentaux. Voilà un peu comment euh, Liboran ne s'est pas fait seulement. En tout cas, quand vous allez voir aujourd'hui un gars qui va vous dire que Liboran est fait seulement pour la désintoxication, non, c'est fait, c'est fait, c'est une, de toutes les façons chez nous, c'est une richesse ici au Gabon. Liboran, c'est une richesse, c'est une plante qu'on ne peut pas euh, négliger ici au Gabon. Toutes les ethnies du Gabon, que ce soit les francs, que ce soit les, les, sur les Michogos, les miennais, ainsi de suite, ainsi de suite. Nous tous, nous sommes tous euh, penchés sur la plante Iboga, qui s'appelle le bois sacré. Voilà. Basse. Bonjour d'abord, Bassé, à vous là-bas. Nous, je vous ai vraiment aimé pourquoi vous nous avez appelé avec mon grand frère. Ce que mon grand frère dit, c'est une vérité. Je crois que je ne peux pas trop répéter les choses. 
Lobuti ou bien Liboga. Oui, mais ce que je parle aujourd'hui, histoire du Buti, c'est quelque chose de sacré. Le Buti, pour nous les femmes, le bois sacré n'était pas donné pour nous. Mais nous, la, nous faisons maintenant, on, on prend les boga, c'est parce qu'il y a quelque chose. Le, euh, les boga, on le prend quand tu es malade, par exemple. Le boga n'est pas mauvais. Le boga nous instruit. Le boga nous donne, nous conduit sur un bon chemin. Parce que quand tu prends le boga, le boga te montre tu montres de bonnes choses. Chez toi, s'il y a quelque chose qui ne marche pas, l'Iboga arrange. Tu dis que ça ne fait pas ça, l'Iboga te conduit. L'Iboga n'est pas mauvais, l'Iboga n'est pas fait seulement pour les gens qui sont malades, par exemple, qui ont des, des, des malades, de, comment on appelle ça? Manteau. L'Iboga, c'est fait pour des gens qui sont normal, l'iboga n'est pas mauvais. Ceux qui pensent que l'iboga est mauvais, ils le pensent mal. L'iboga, c'est quelque chose que nos parents ont commencé depuis nos ancêtres. L'iboga existe. Et nous aussi, nous continuons toujours à faire ce l'iboga. L'iboga partout dans le Gabon. L'iboga est partout dans nos, dans nos provinces mais, par exemple, à l'estuaire, les gens, les, les, les femmes, aujourd'hui, sont en train de planter l'iboga parce qu'ils ont vu que l'iboga est bon. Mais, par exemple, à l'angounier, la nyanga, euh, le moyen, bon, à la, à, à, à moyen le goué, l'iboga est vraiment, on ne le plante pas. C'est quelque chose, une richesse qu'on nous a donnée comme ça laissé par Dieu, et en tout cas, nous le considérons, c'est un bois sacré. Ça, c'est quelque chose, c'est un don que Dieu nous a donné. En tout cas, l'Iboga n'est pas mauvais. L'Iboga est là pour enranger, pour soigner. Quand la femme a un problème, par exemple, tu prends ton Iboga, en tout cas, ton problème est réglé. L'Iboga n'est pas mauvais, les enfants. En tout cas, c'est un seul conseil. Il ne faut pas avoir peur quand vous prenez l'iboga, même quand les gens viennent s'initier, sauf si les gens le prennent à mal. Mais ça, quand tu dois un mètre, tu suis un mètre qui est bien, l'iboga n'a pas de problème. Tu sors tranquille jusqu'à ton initiation sans problème. En tout cas, chez nous, l'iboga n'est pas mal. Merci encore. Iboga is a plant that is only found in Gabon. Originally, Iboga would only grow in places in the provinces like in Gunye, um, the middle Ogwe and Nyanga. With the discovery of Iboga by the other tribes, Iboga was then planted in provinces like Estuier. So Iboga is something that has been existed for centuries. Iboga has been existing since the time of our ancestors. You have to know something. Iboga in here, in our land, we call Iboga the sacred plant. The sacred plant. It is a gift that was given by God. It's a plant that you won't find anywhere else, but just Gabon. Iboga is 
used for many things. Initiation, healing. Um, it helps people who are lost. Hiboga, if I can resume, is used in many, in many things. Before, let's say in the years 1800, Iboga was not, well, our ancestors never allowed Iboga consumption by people coming from outside, foreigners, strangers, they would call. It was forbidden and also initiating people coming from elsewhere from other places was not allowed either that doesn't mean that iboga is only for gabonese people we know iboga is for everyone whether you white black yellow red any everyone everyone but if iboga was not allowed um uh, to other other tribes, other ethical groups, people coming from outside. It's simply because of wars, colonization, and slavery. So our ancestors closed themselves. They, let's say, they, they shut themselves down from the world when it comes to Iboga, it, because, it is because of those reasons. But we know very well that Iboga is for everybody. And also because we know that time have changed. Times have changed. And because times have changed, we are more open to the world because the world is also opening itself to us. There is an exchange of culture. For instance, you are teaching us English. This is something we're getting from you. And in return, we are happy to also share with you our culture. It's in our duty to be the ambassador of our culture and Iboga and to share it with you. You have to also know something. We have heard that out there, Iboga is considered to be a medicine for drug addicts. and that it can only be used for the purpose of this uh, de detox. I'm going to tell you, this is wrong. It is wrong. Iboga is not only for detox. Iboga, Iboga is good medicine for, this, for, for detox, for drug addicts, for the simple reason that Iboga has a purpose, is to reconnect oneself with his soul, with his spirit. And Iboga is also a very important element when some oneself soul is lost, it also allows the reconnection Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If you want to know Iboga, we are here to accompany you. Basse.
I'll offer this to you or whoever you think would best answer this, Kevin, but um, I noticed that you went to, to an Ibogaine clinic and I'm curious about, you know, the, I, I've heard some people who practice with Iboga say that, that it's hard to synthesize. And um, so I'm curious about the difference between Ibogaine and Iboga for someone who doesn't know very much about this medicine if you're willing to start us off. Yeah, Ken, I'll throw that one over to you to start. Okay, uh, Ibogaine, um, Ibogaine hydrochloride uh, is produced by two methods. One is the extraction uh, from the Tabernanthe iboga plant, and that's a, an alcohol-based ex extraction, very simple procedure uh, chemically that is over a century old. Um, uh, the other, and that produces a something that is usually about 95 to 98 percent um, uh, purity, uh, and the major purity is usually another um, uh, variant, uh, a structural relative of ibogaine called ibogamine. The other uh, is uh, to what is called semi-synthesis, is to start with a alkaloid uh, boacangine that's closely related structurally to ibogaine and then convert it to ibogaine. And that often produces purities of 98 or 99% or better. Um, total synthesis of ibogaine, I believe is possible, but it is not uh, the means by which ibogaine hydrochloride is, pr is, is produced. It's either semi-synthesis from boacangine or um, extraction from Tabernanthe iboga. Um, and then alkaloid extract is basically an extract of a lesser purity um, uh, in terms of ibogaine hydrochloride uh, by intention uh, that basically contains uh, other alkaloids, including um, uh, iboga alkaloids that are closely related uh, to ibogaine uh, structural analogs, uh, which may produce the uh, ensemble effect that I referenced uh, in my talk. Elizabeth, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would say that, you know, ibogaine, it, so again, it's one, one alkaloid uh, and sometimes from this other plant. Uh, and <clears throat> iboga is all of the original alkaloids that is served in uh, multiple forms, including root bark, tea and extraction, total alkaloid extraction. And all of those alkaloids uh, contribute to the spirit, contribute to what is offered and, and at the same time, ibogaine, especially from this more sustainable, uh, maybe I'm saying this wrong, Boacanja Africana uh, <clears throat> has a place, especially in preliminary detox when done properly. Uh, so it's just, it's a different experience. I've heard from people who have done both who say that it is a deeper experience, the total alkaloid, um, and both very important and useful. That's all. Thanks. And uh, Gray, I'm wondering if you would like to um, channel an answer from Mama Nunu about this question in particular, about what perhaps um, makes working with iboga in its natural form um, special compared to alkaloid extraction or synthetic purified ibogaine. Hello? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Can you. Yes, can you please repeat the question? What, what makes working with iboga in its natural form different than an extract of an alkaloid or a synthetic Form of ibogaine. Elle dit que cassirant du boga, l'utilisation du boga pur, différent de euh, l'utilisation du boga en forme médicinale, comme par exemple l'ibogaïne. Qu'est-ce qui fait la différence? Parce qu'on ne le prend pas là. Attends, il ne faut pas qu'il réponde. Nous, on le fait d'abord. On le prend frais mm -hmm. et pur. Non, en fait, juste réponds à la question. Oui. En fait, il dit. Tu as l'iboga pur, oui. d'accord Et tu as également euh, d'autres formes. 
mm-hmm. que eux, ils utilisent comme l'ibogaïne, mm-hmm. la partie, si tu veux, la forme médicinale de l'ibogaïne. C'est l'ibogaïne, là. Donc, elle demande, elle demande pourquoi c'est, pour, c'est, pour toi, c'est quoi la différence Il y a une grande différence parce que moi, j'utilise l'iboga, euh, comment on appelle C'est qu'on prend directement en forêt. Mm-hmm. Il y a une grande différence par D'accord. rapport à ça. Bon, moi, je vais peut-être encore ajouter. Oui. Euh, So she's saying that the difference is that she takes her iboga directly right from the forest. She says it's pure. And she's she with the assistance of the ancestor, the iboga in uh, the sorry, the iboga is bet, better for the soul in that form. And that's where she sees the difference. Thank you. Uh, I will just add, in, from my ex- from my experience, um, doing ibogaine for detox, essentially, uh, addiction interruption is perhaps a little more of a good analogy to it. Um, but effectively, it was a detox treatment. Um, and compared to the uh, two Bwiti style ceremonies that were facilitated and I participated in last month with more traditional forms of medicine, um, I, I can really just comment on Ibogaine being incredibly overwhelming and fast. It, it took a long time to take effect and it rapidly, I experienced a rapid onset, which was very helpful for the state that I was in to be relieved of the phys- physiological withdrawal symptoms and the agony of that. Um, and then, you know, in my mind's eye, just sort of catapulted outward into outer space and having a full night of navigating the beauty of my psyche and being able to be given the opportunity to fall in love with myself at a time where I really needed something like that. And in comparison, Iboga, I felt the effects come on quite quickly within less than 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, And I I recognized the difference in pacing and I found it to be a much slower and manageable experience and, and quite beautiful in terms of being able to Uh, appreciate the full state of it as an, as an interactive opportunity with with my soul, with with my higher self, and with the questions that had been um, put together to support my intention. There's a uh, mm-hmm. uh, there's another ahead, really interesting, uh, can I, uh, I there, there's a really interesting variable also is the degree of physical dependence. Um, I've heard from providers that sometimes where people are highly physically dependent on opioids, the experience is less visionary uh, as if the dependence is using it up somehow in their terms. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it is not uncommon for people to seek a detoxification that has less visionary features and then then follow it with a psycho-spiritual treatment when they're not studying from a, a point of physical dependence. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Mama Nunu. I, I would love to add that we see that all the time, Ken, that the more uh, polluted someone comes in with a substance and more dependence, the medicine is busy detoxifying mm-hmm. them. And there's, it's busy and, and it can provide fewer visions, fewer insights, uh, less soul healing. That's the first thing that it must do in order to go deeper. And thank you, Mama Nunu, for talking about uh the 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 connection to the forest and being closer to the forest and the presence of the ancestors um i i would add that intention with which the medicine is taken which with the medicine is harvested we understand in the buiti as just as important as receiving the medicine into our body that respect in that sustainable harvest singing to the medicine taking only what we need, allowing that plant to continue to grow for many generations. Um, and, and what is the intention? What is the ceremony? Uh, what is the care, the spiritual care with ibogaine in a, a, a laboratory as it's being semi-synthesized or synthesized? Um, and again, it can be very useful and important as a step. But for me, putting medicine in my body, I need it to uh, be cared for from the moment it leaves the earth and the medicine responds to that. 
Okay, yeah, okay, I'll mute myself. So, Mama Nono wants to say something. Uh, Emma, merci Elizabeth. She's saying thank you to Elizabeth. Je suis très fier she de says vous she's avoir comme une élève. Of, she's very proud of you. She's very proud to have you as her, her, her student. Je sais que vraiment vous êtes sorti de mon école et vraiment j'en ai fier. Je suis très fier. She says that she can feel deep in herself that you really come from her school and she is very proud. Je t'attends que tu puisses revenir et je te donne encore plus de force. She says that she is waiting for you. You have to get back here because she <laughs> has to give you something more, something bigger. Merci. Merci. Très bien. Je t'aime. Je t'aime aussi, mon bébé. <laughs> oh, hello, Mama Nunu. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. sleeping. Gadi. Everybody. Uh, Bazi. Bazi. <laughs> More, more family on the call. Thank you. Um, I did. I believe uh, Chipinana is on on the call. I don't see his video, but I think he's on. Sorry, Mama uh -huh. Nogo. No, no. She has. She hasn't. She says that she was not done. She, oh. 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 She, she wants oh, to say to Kevin. What do you want to say to Kevin? Que vraiment, je suis très contente de ce qu'on a vu, ce qui s'est présenté. She Nous says a... that she is very, she doesn't know Kevin, but she can feel for him. And that she is, um, she was um, uh, happy with what he said. And she says she, she admires him. He's come a long way. And that, um, you know, she's, you know, proud of you without knowing you. Mm -hmm. Merci. Thank you. There was a, a question about sustainability, and, and I wonder if uh, Chief Banana wants to answer this question first um, about the use of naturally sourced ibogaine or iboga and its exportation to the West, whether for addiction treatment or any other kinds. I wonder what is being done to ensure the availability of iboga, given that it only grows naturally in equatorial Western Africa? Est-ce que tu m'as entendu, Papa Binana? Oui, je suis là. Tu t'as entendu. Reprends la question, reprends la question. Reprends bien la question. OK. Donc, la question est de savoir, il veut savoir ce que toi, ce que Papa Binana, ma, Papa Binana ressent et ce qu'il pense hein, par rapport en fait à l'accessibilité de l'iboga. Sachant que l'iboga pousse uniquement au Gabon naturellement et que lorsqu'il est importé, il est modifié en fait. Quel est son ressenti par rapport à ça? Quel est son avis? Qu'est-ce qu'il pense de ça? Bon, euh, oui. Oui. Euh, auparavant, Iboga n'était pas importé, n'est-ce pas? Oui. Maintenant, c'est ces dernières années-là qu'on voit que l'Iboga est. Euh, les gens en ont besoin dans les pays là, les, les Occidentaux en ont besoin. Mais moi, je dis, nous, ici, au Gabon, nous le consommons, nous le consommons brut. Il n'y a pas de mélange. Il y a pas, on n'utilise aucune machine pour transformer l'iboga en gélule ou autre chose. Le reste, en tout cas, nous, on le consomme. Mais il y a beaucoup de façons de consommer l'iboga. Bon, mm -hmm. nous, par exemple, quand, quand on initie quelqu'un, on a trois, on a trois euh, manières. On, mm -hmm. on prend soit le frais, le, le, le frais mm -hmm. et soit on prend le frais ou on prend le pilet où on fait ouïr aussi les racines de l'Iboga pour que la personne okay. puisse aller loin. C'est ça, c'est comme ça que nous, on l'utilise ici. Ok. Et, que tu euh, euh, papa Binana, attendez, attendez. Que vous prenez ça oui. frais ou, ou écrasé ou en poudre Qu'est-ce que tu... Je ne comprends pas. Quand tu dis frais, c'est que la racine, vous la croquez fraîchement oh, la Oui, mais tu as, tu as assisté. On gratte. Quand c'est frais, on gratte. 
la personne D'accord. consomme comme ça en broyant, D'accord. c'est ça. Donc, c'est soit frais, donc gratté purement, oui. ou alors en poudre. Oui. Ok. D'accord. En poudre aussi, on le sèche au soleil et on pile. On pile, D'accord. on sèche au soleil et on pile. Bon, par D'accord. contre, moi, je veux te dire, c'est si gré. Le, le frais va, va faire plus d'effet de, de, de sur le corps humain. Voilà. D'accord. Parce que le frais, mmh. vite fait, tu, 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 le frais, quand tu le consommes, vite fait, tu navigues, comme on le dit ici, tu navigues plus vite. Par contre, mmh. ce qui est mmh. séché, il est là. Ce qui est séché, il est là. Il y a un peu de retard. D'accord. Okay. Ça dépend des organismes. Mmh. Oui. Et, et papa, est-ce que tu penses que eux, quand même, en traitant un peu, en, c'est-à-dire en transformant, en essayant de multiplier un laboratoire, est-ce qu'ils ont, ils peuvent quand même en tirer le, le, l'essence principale de l'hybride Ah ben vraiment, c'est quelque chose qui a été fait euh, euh, là où ça pousse. Bon, mais je, à mon avis, moi je ne crois pas. Oui. Okay. Donc, je vais déjà d'abord répondre à la question. Oui. Euh, donc, qu'est-ce que tu penses Parce que, comme il disait encore, euh, y a, je ne pense pas que la, la question… Il manque un petit élément. Euh, bon, tu, tu nous as un peu dit qu'en fait, euh, voilà, avant, on n'importait pas et que maintenant qu'ils en ont besoin. Et que, sachant que la version fraîche est la meilleure, toi, qu'est-ce que tu penses comment, Est-ce que tu aurais des idées à comment peut-être véhiculer l'Iboga dans son entité, comment on, on, le, on le prend ici pour obtenir le résultat que l'on veut. Je pense que c'est plus dans ce sens-là que tu devrais aller. Ah, ok. Bon, ici, nous ici, hein, voilà. Euh, ils ont la, ça a les mêmes effets, tu comprends. D'accord. Mais nous ici, quand on initie, quand on initie ici, on prend plus le, 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 le frais hein, pour pour vite, pour que la personne essaie de vite voir. Bon, là-bas, ils le transforment de leur manière. Ah, bon, non, je pense non, que, non, euh, non. comme ils réussissent même à désintoxiquer euh, les, les, les gens, j'espère qu'ils font de leur manière et que ça réussit. Ça réussit, c'est la même chose. Okay. Comme c'est le, le même. Donc, en gros, tu es en train de dire que euh, tant que la formule qu'ils utilisent, fonctionne pour eux, ils peuvent continuer oui, comme ça. Oui. Ils peuvent continuer comme ça. Oui. Ça va Parce que c'est, Gré, c'est, c'est pas c'est facile ça. qu'ils puissent. Gré, hum? Gré, c'est pas oui. facile qu'ils puissent prendre le frais et aller avec euh, ça arrive frais non. Déjà de quand on le prend frais, nous on le hum. prend frais sur le même jour, on le gratte et on donne le même jour. Mais par contre si eux ils prennent frais pour la, le, le transporter chez eux, ça n'a plus le même effet. Mm-hmm. Yes. Voilà. Non, c'est bon. Quand ils amènent Donc, ils n'avaient pas répondre. continué avec euh, leur façon de faire. Oui. D'accord. Ok. Toi, tu te dis comme tu comprends. Pour arranger. D'accord. So, um, he's the, he, Vinana says um, that um, he's coming back to the past where Iboga was not allowed um, outside of Gabon. The exportation mm-hmm. of Iboga was forbidden. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that now that it is allowed and the Western need it as much as we need it, um, it, is, it is okay to carry on using the medicine in the form you're using it because it seems as if it works for you. Uh, he says that here, for instance, we take it uh, in three forms, in three different forms. You can consume it fresh. So the, 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 um, so the plant is taken, it's grated freshly and then consumed or You can have it uh, as a powder, and this is the as, that's the, the form that travel that is mostly uh, exported. So the plant is dried, dried out completely, and then grated. It makes a powder, and then you have the third version, which is a tea. So this is we to, we're talking about the roots of iboga, 
being boiled in water and then consumed as a tea, as tea. He says that when it's taken in the, in the fresh form, it, it, it has um, a more effect, like the effect is, is, more, is, is more, it's more efficient, it's more efficient. And also it allows the um, astral, the, the, the astral traveling faster. So you go faster uh, and it's the best form. And considering that you can't have it fresh, you can't take it fresh because for instance, you decide to take a piece of it with you, fresh out of here. By the time you reach you, you reach the USA, for example, the plant the plant would have lost a lot of its elements, a lot of its virtues, so it won't work. So for the time being, you can only uh, use it in the form you have access to. Your country, Eric. Does he is he is he answering your question? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. Um, and I definitely encourage people to check out the organization that Elizabeth uh, mentioned in the chat, the Blessings of the Forest, for more um, specific ways that uh, sustainability efforts are being maintained, both in recognition of you know some of the need of exportation, but also with the understanding that there's there's not an endless supply um, and especially important for maintaining the ability for Gabonese people to take priority. Yes, okay. I, I just wanted to add too that we also are helping to support um, plantations um, there through our elders. Okay, so I think maybe I'm going to ask him again because he developed another aspect but Let's bring back up the sustainability aspect. So I'll ask him the question. Uh, Papa Binana, en fait, la question était plus portée sur, uh, le, si tu veux, la, uh, la soutenabilité de l'exportation de la plante. Ah. La pérennité, en fait. OK? Donc, en termes de uh, provision, Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour que, par exemple, la provision, ceux qui partent d'ici pour aller chez eux, ne s'arrêtent jamais? Est-ce que nous, on est assez d'Iboga pour continuer à fournir, euh, par exemple, le centre d'Elisabeth? Parce qu'il est en train de dire que euh, pour la, la pérennité, il va s'orienter vers Elisabeth, vers le centre d'Elisabeth et Nyangu pour savoir comment s'y prendre. Et donc, Elisabeth était en train de dire qu'ils soutiennent déjà un peu l'agriculture ici. Donc, c'est plus dans ce sens-là. En fait, qu'est-ce qui est en train d'être fait concrètement au Gabon pour pouvoir euh, assurer, assurer la pérennité dans l'exportation de l'Iboga Pour que eux, ils ont toujours de la disponibilité, pour qu'il n'y ait pas de rupture dans la forêt d'Abonnaise, par exemple, à Mayumba et tout, le bois ne manque pas à Ukraine. Euh, ok. Gré. Oui. Gré. Oui. Bon, voici. Nous, nous sommes, en, nous sommes en train de travailler euh, sur, pour une association. D'accord. Pour avoir plus de documentation de l'Iboga. D'accord. Nous sommes là-dessus. Voilà. Ok. Mais tu sais, au Gabon, quand, vous, toi, quand tu parles, par exemple, de Libreville. De... OK. Uh, I think we've lost um, Chief Binana. Just for now. Là, tu vois toute cette étendue de terre, là, c'est plein. <coughs> Papa Binana? Attends, oui. On t'avait perdu. Donc, Gré? Oui tu nous entends? Oui, oui, moi je vous entends. Ok. Donc, papa, papa, tu, as écouté, tu as entendu ce que papa a dit? Oui, j'ai entendu. Une, une bonne partie. Il parlait de l'association et de la plantation. Et quand il a parlé de, de je pense, de Libreville, c'est là où je l'ai perdu. 
Non, je disais, vous voyez, le gabon, tout est à bord, il y a la forêt. Hein? Nous pouvons, s'il y a les moyens, faire plus de plantation des doigts. En tout cas, 80%, on peut vraiment planter les bois au Gabon. Il y a des places que les bois gagnent. Donc, Greg, tu as vu Oui, papa a dit que les bois poussent de manière naturelle. D'accord mm -hmm. Mais il y a également la possibilité de produire le yoga de manière, on va dire, industrielle, industrielle. en respectant les, les besoins de la plante, c'est-à-dire en ne mettant ah oui. pas les produits chimiques qui vont tuer voilà, les, 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 les capacités, etc. Les capacités de Maintenant, okay. en termes de disponibilité, il y a la disponibilité sur, au Gabon parce qu'il y a des terres énormes de, 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 exploitables. Oh. Maintenant, c'est... Pour, pour se lancer dans, ces, dans cette, dans cette exploitation-là, il faut avoir, mm -hmm. un, le financement mm -hmm. pour les débouchés pour être sûr que les, le produit va être vendu. Mm -hmm. OK. D'accord. J'ai compris. OK. So, um, Chief Pinana was saying that uh, they, uh, for the sustainability, they, they, work, they working with um, a... a an association of people uh, that is for planting. They basically, they're working on a Iboga plantation project. So um, they say that they, you know, the needs will always be fulfilled. Iboga can never, uh, there can never be a lack of Iboga because first of all, Iboga grows naturally And second of all, iboga can be planted. It can, it can be, it can be planted. It can be um, uh, I, at an industri industrial level. Okay. Uh, on one condition that certain practice are not used. Um, like, for example, um, elements used in agriculture, like uh, pesticides and all these products. But he says, whatever the need, whether it's the needs that is existing now, a pre-existing need, a future need, whether it grows, there will always be a way to supply. And he was saying, if, if the plant is needed at, uh, let's say, at uh, an industrial level, all that is needed is fi fi uh, financing, okay? Financing and uh, the people and the land is there. There's plenty of land to grow it. Oh, yes. Basi. Basi. So, yeah. When, when it comes to sustainability, you should not worry. I, I, I hope that now you, you have the complete answer. Thank you for following up. Yes, I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for all of your attention and engagement. I'm sorry we couldn't get to other questions, but we do want to honor your time Um, before the next panel. So we're, we're going to move into a break now, but I'll let, I'll let Jamie and Sarah step in. Thank you so much to Kevin and all of the panelists. And um, you know, I just want to say, I was receiving a number of private messages of people saying best class ever. Um, and uh, for me, I was just feeling like, you know, the presence of family and, you know, teachers and elders and students and just sort of a wish of like, yeah, couldn't all of our classes be this way? You know, people just really bringing in their, um, yeah, families and lineage and connection. And um, thank you so much, um, truly to Kevin and um, all of our panelists and uh, especially to uh, Gray for translating, uh, Mama Nunu and uh, Chief Binana. Thank you so, so much. Um, just so people are aware, you know, I believe that they had to travel to the Capitol, um, you know, to be able to be online, to be with us and just feeling so much um, gratitude, you know, and um, 
Uh, thank you so much, Ken, you know, especially for your um, opening presentation. You know, as I mentioned, this was not something that we were planning on doing from the beginning. And, you know, part of it was because we really wanted to be sure that if we were going to include this medicine, that it would be, um, you know, presented well and, um, you know, presented in a way with care. And um, so this was just an absolutely uh, wonderful panel. Uh, thank you all so much. And uh, we will now have a short break until um, coming back at 11.45 Mountain Time. Merci, Mathieu. Merci beaucoup. Papa. Merci, Mama Nuno. Mama, Mama Nuno, Merci. Merci, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, thank yes. you.